Uh, welcome back. I told you that was a, a very quick break um, and we're here. Um, we've got a really exciting session to build on the last one. Um, and I just really want to introduce the mighty Anne Longfield, uh, who is uh, all kinds of things. Um, and but she was a <laughs> Excellent children's commissioner um, and uh, also conducted the commission on young lies and uh, you know really really pleased that you're here to, to uh, not over, not only wearing your northern powerhouse hat but to also run this session and I'll also welcome uh, Alex uh, over to you. Well, that was an intro. Um, so I'm just really just a minute warm up uh, before uh, we've got the minister to speak. Um, and um, I've been uh, working with a lot of people um, in different organizations across the north for now, probably about five, four or five years since um, I published a report which looked at growing up in the north. And a lot of the things that I saw were shocking even to me that you know lived here in terms of the disparities between North and South. We've had the pandemic since then, and we've got the changing world of work, um, labor shortages, new forms of work and the like, all challenges. Um, and we've got leveling up, which we, you know, whatever we call it, um, I want us to embrace and uh, make happen because actually those young people uh, need us, whatever we want to call it, uh, to make those differences and make those changes work. Um, so uh, a, a, a tough brief there, but we've got um, no better person here to uh, to speak to us. Alex Burkhart is the Minister of Apprentices and Skills. I've worked with him for many years and been uh, really pleased to do so, and really great to have this opportunity to um, be in the same room today. We're going to have some questions afterwards, but just a few, because he's on a tight fence. Brilliant. Uh, look, thank you. Uh, thank you so much um, for that introduction. And uh, yeah, for those of you who don't know, uh, me and Anne used to work together when she was the Children's Commissioner, uh, and I can confirm she is all sorts of things. Um, uh, all of them, all of them good. Um, uh, it, it's wonderful to be uh, here in Manchester today. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me. I, you know, every time I come to Manchester, you, you can't help uh, but feel sort of tangible sense of, uh, of drive. Um, it, you feel it in the conversations that you have with people in the dynamism of the institutions uh, and also in the construction uh, you know just every time i come a new enormous and exciting buildings being hauled out of the ground yeah you know, there this is this is a place where where things are happening and um i uh, yeah you know, I, I must warn you I, i'm sort of prone to long historical digressions because i used to be a history teacher and there's part of me that's never been reprogrammed but yeah you know, the, the first mention of manchester in the uh in the historical record is uh, from about 920, when Alfred the Great's son, Edward the Elder, sent an army to Manchester to refortify the Roman fort uh, and uh, re-establish the town as part of a fight back against the Vikings. Uh, and it was those towns, those fortifications that were made at the beginning of the 10th century, which became the centers of trade, became the centers of education, became the centers of skills. And so right from the start, Manchester has been involved in the birth of our national story, but in the life of our national story, in bringing together those things, those elements of skills, of trade, uh, and of uh, of stability. And today, um, you know, we see it all over again uh, in the partnerships that are being formed between the MCA, uh, between the uh, the Department for Education and government more widely, and also through all of the FE colleges. Uh, and all of the wonderful independent providers of skills that we have in the city. And um, never before, I think in my life, has there been a time in our country when there has been such a hunger for skills. You know, huge numbers of vacancies opening up the, con uh, the economy, huge numbers of opportunities for people of all ages and stages, uh, if they have the means to take advantage of those chances. Uh, and I want to tell you this morning about some of the things that uh, we're doing in DFE to help more people be able to take advantage of those chances uh, and also how that work is tying in with the work that's happening, not just here in Manchester, but all across uh, the north and all across the regions of England. Um, one of the things that is absolutely central to the work that myself and Nadim Zahawi are doing uh, at the moment is to try and create a skills system 
in which the voice of the employer is more clearly heard. And what we're trying to do is uh, make sure that we have qualifications that have been designed with employers that will give students the skills the economy needs. Um, we're doing that at level three, the equivalent of A level, the new T levels that uh, we've been um, uh, devising with employers um, that uh, give students not only the most up-to-date skills, but also give them 45 days working uh, on a job in the workplace as part of that uh, part of that program. You know, for years, employers have said that there are too many uh, students leaving technical education without experience of the workplace, uh, without uh, job ready um, on the job experience. We are, um, we are starting to tackle that. Um, but we're also looking again at technical qualifications uh, level two, the GCSE equivalent, to make sure that, uh, that they all uh, lead towards jobs and that they are all um, are up to speed with the latest uh, innovations that are taking place in the workplace. Um, obviously, the skills agenda goes way beyond um, 16 to 19, and that the vast majority of our workforce, our 2030 workforce, has already left formal education. And we need to make sure that um, all of those people who want to skill up and need to skill up have the opportunity to be able to do so. And because of that, uh, two years ago, the Prime Minister announced uh, his free courses for jobs initiative, meaning that anyone who didn't get an A-level equivalent when they were in formal education can at any time go back and get a technical qualification at that level for free. Uh, we have um, the Chancellor's Project Multiply to make sure those who are adults with low numeracy will be able to get tuition to get that basic skill, which we know is one of the great drivers uh, of higher wages. Uh, and uh, we also have a project I'm, I'm extremely excited about at the moment, uh, our skills boot camps you know, 12 to 16 week courses that help people um, skill up, you know, often change career, perhaps coming out of a period of unemployment or coming back to work, uh, having uh, had a period off to uh, have children or, uh, you know, have caring responsibilities, uh, a chance to get a, a quick step up into a new job and take advantage of, uh, of opportunities that, uh, that are emerging in the jobs market. Uh, and then in a couple of years time, we will have the lifelong loan entitlement. Uh, giving everybody the opportunity to uh, take out a loan to study uh, technical qualifications at levels four and five. You know, we know that this is one of the big gaps in our skills economy relative to other mature economies. And, uh, you know, it's going to be a great chance for people to, uh, to switch careers, but also progress faster in the careers they've chosen. And all of this um, uh, runs alongside uh, the work that we are doing uh, with local areas, um, obviously with, uh, with local devolved administrations, but also with local groups of employers, because we don't just need to make sure that the qualifications and the courses we're offering are giving people the right skills. We need to make sure that those courses are available. And, uh, and so the local skills improvement plans, which will um, hopefully by uh, this time next year exist uh, across the country, will set the skills priorities uh, for, for areas so that uh, colleges and independent training providers uh, and the like uh, know what courses employers are asking for. Um, you know, and that, when you plug it all together, gives students and prospective students uh, more confidence that the course they're doing is going to lead to the job they want. It gives employers more confidence that the courses that are being provided are going to give them the skills they want. It gives us the opportunity to grow prosperity in all parts of our country. And I, you know, the first uh, visit I, I went on as a minister um, uh, is uh, strangely pertinent to my visit today because it was to Salford Media City and uh, in Salford I saw one of our digital skills boot camps uh, yeah, and these were groups of people, um, range of backgrounds, range of stages in life, uh, doing an intensive course in cyber security uh, in Salford Media City uh, and then when they graduated from that uh, they were many of them were going on to do uh, apprenticeships um, in Salford Media City and going on to get jobs in Salford Media City. And so we saw this fantastic matchup between the needs of uh, the individual, the needs of business and the provision of skills. And what we were, uh, what I got to uh, watch, I mean, you got to you know, meet the people, local people who were benefiting from a massive local success story and adding, you know, getting the opportunity to get new jobs themselves, but also adding to the prosperity of their city and so creating more opportunities for people to come. Uh, my, um, uh, similarly, a few weeks ago, I was privileged enough to see, um, to uh, be part of a meeting in DFE 
where um, we had um, we had a, a delegation come to us from Teesside, and Red Car in Cleveland have um, uh, brilliantly formed a partnership with BP. Uh, BP are going to set up a new massive new state of the art hydrogen plant in Freeport, in a Freeport that uh, the government has been able to uh, be able to create on on Teesside. So the uh, the, the um, local council has found uh, the land. The government has created uh, the Freeport, and BP have brought this great new green technology, uh, which is going to employ thousands of people. And they are working with the local colleges to make sure that local uh, young people and local people changing career are going to get the skills to work in that hydrogen plant. And that is, uh, again, a wonderful example of how when we all work in partnership, where everybody, every part of the system, local and national, works together, we can give local people new opportunities to drive forward prosperity in their cities. People, place and prosperity. You know, this for me is the very essence of levelling up. And uh, for me, it's skills that tie it all together. Thank you very much for listening. I'm very happy to take some questions then. Great stuff. Um, well, thank you uh, for that, Alex. I know you've not got um, long. Um, can we do a quick sweep of questions? Is that all right if we do two? You deal with uh, your, your interest. <laughs> no, actually, your, <laughs> your office is in charge of that. Um, okay, we're going to do these three. Let's go for these three first. This lady here, gentleman there, and this lady here. But can we have them really um, brief because um, we're really against time? Hi, it's, I don't know if this is working. I still it is. Can hear me. Good. Um, so my name's Jane. I work for Child Poverty Action Group on a project which is looking to help potential second earners back into employment. It's very much based on the statistic that for low income families, they require 1.5 salaries, 1.5 wages in order not to be living in poverty. So we're looking at supporting in practical terms and looking at exploring what the barriers are for those potential second earners. We've been rolling this out in Berry for, for a year now. And one of the big, big barriers that we found is, is training for people that have been out of the workforce. And it's not just the training being available, it's actually the childcare. It's the barriers that people have in their homes and in their work and in their families to access that training. So where the will is there, and a lot of the mo mostly mums, some dads that I've been supporting are wanting to go back into work. They're wanting to upskill. They just are not able to because they cannot access the training because they can't fund the childcare. Is, right. is that something that, that you could address? Yeah, I know that sounds like really, um, <laughs> Sounds like really Im important research and work, and yeah, very much the sort of thing we're we're interested in. And my my colleague Will Quince uh, is at the moment looking at childcare from a whole series of perspectives as part of the response to to your know, cost of living uh, issues. Uh, and I'll I'll certainly pass on the work that you're doing, but I know that he's very alive to making sure that um, uh, absence of childcare isn't a blockage to people skilling up or going back into work. So um, he'd be interested to see that, I'm sure. Yeah, I think that the link between training and employment and childcare at one point had got it was very strong, and as more childcare has become available, that's kind of moved on, but it remains in terms of return to work. Um, I think uh, this lady here. Hi, Prime Minister. Thank you for this. Um, about sixty-two percent of um, people living in the north of England are living in an area with a mayoral combined authority. I was wondering what your assessment has been on the skills devolution that we've had thus far. So I think skills devolution is obviously a very important part of the, um, the, yeah, the future of devolution settlements and skills provision. Um, and I think that the, the, the sort of the world we, we are, we're moving into is uh, going to be one where there are, uh, there, there are sort of two, uh, for, for, there, there are two major players with a number of intermediaries. Uh, obviously, uh, MCAs, um, uh, great work that they're doing uh, with adults in order to you know, uh, get them into work. But then, and then the work that DFE is doing through, uh, uh, obviously through the intermediary FE colleges, but also new initiatives that we're trying to get off the ground. 
And I think over time, there will be conversations about whether those new initiatives get devolved down once we've established proof of model, um, then uh, I think, um, you know, the, those, those MCAs that uh, are performing well on skills, you know, would obviously uh, want to talk to us about whether they, they take some of those things on. Um, but um, so I think, I think we're, in, we're in a very exciting phase where there's different types of innovation happening uh, in different parts of the country, but also uh, through um, uh, different organizations or different, different branches of government. And I think that's all to the good. Is there a gentleman? Hello, thank you. Um, John Hamilton from Get Your Qualifications. We're an awarding body who are making qualifications known to employers, et cetera. Um, my question is around T levels. Um, are T levels actually counterproductive to leveling up? Because if you take a young child, a young learner in 16 to 18 in Blackpool, a young learner 16 to 18 in Manchester, they will have different opportunities in the digital marketplace. So therefore, surely that is actually counterintuitive to leveling up because there isn't the opportunity for the learner in Blackpool to have the same opportunity to learn due to the work placement and all, all such things as well. So yeah, uh, also 5,500 learners currently, it needs to upgrade by 100% to get to the level of VTEX currently. So is there the appetite in the employer space to actually take this on, especially in those in the hardest to reach areas where leveling up is most needed? Well, no, John, these are very uh, important questions. And um, well, I should say at the start that one of our biggest advocates for T-levels is the college in Blackpool. Um, uh, Bev Robinson is um, you know, one of the complete cheerleaders who keeps asking me why we're not going faster. And um, I think that we what we have to make sure of is that in creating this new qualification, where uh, you know, which has many strengths, uh, one of which I believe is a serious work placement, that we have, um, that we're not shutting people out of the opportunity of getting it. And that's why I think your question is very important. What we found in our um, trailblazers, which are in a range of places across the country, some of them particularly def deprived areas, is that um, the initial setup uh, conversations around work placements can be quite difficult, but that's why we're deploying a lot of resource in DFE to, to help them happen. Once uh, employers have done them once, it's then much easier to build on that relationship and keep them going. Uh, and some colleges are already reporting, you know, some colleges that are now enter, about to enter their um, third year of T-levels are saying that they already have their work placements lined up for, for year three, which is, simply wasn't the case in years one and two. Um, so we, we do have a big challenge of, uh, of step up. This is, you know, this is, uh, but this is why the department's putting so much energy into it. And, uh, you know, one of the things that does keep me awake at night is making sure that we're going to get enough work placements. However, we managed, you know, through a lot of hard graft, and part of my officials and college leaders, we managed to get enough work placements during COVID. And that gives me hope that in normal times, we'll be able to do likewise. We do, yes. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Andy Forbes, uh, Lifelong Education Commission, and uh, very much welcome the direction of travel. But like many other people, uh, the challenges are still out there. And I'd just like to build on what's just been said, because there is a long term trend of employers in the UK not investing as much as some of our uh, you know, parallel countries in the OECD yep. in training and development. Uh, and that T-level question just reminded me that that's part of a, a wider issue. What incentives can we can we introduce to get employers uh, investing more in workforce development as part of this? overall initiative. Well, I, I you imagine you saw the Chancellor's May's lecture earlier in the year where he posed just that question. He didn't answer that question, um, but he did pose it. Uh, I understand that he's going to uh, start answering it um, in the autumn. And um, I, I, like you, very much looking forward to what he has to say. I think we have to let the Minister go now, do we? Yeah, um, I can see that um, he needs to leave the room. So uh, could I ask you to thank him? Uh, for joining us today and uh, for taking those questions. Um, I think, you know, at the heart of it, we, we feel the energy and everyone knows that the potential is there, but we need to unleash that talent. And I think that's for the long term. Uh, so we look forward to con continuing to work with you on that. Thank you so much. All right, take care. And I can't believe you started with a Roman force. You still do that. <laughs> Sorry, I'm <laughs> Thank you. Okay.
we're now going to move on to our uh, panel now. So could I invite up uh, Shay uh, Abakin from Centrepoint, Georgina Burt from Child Poverty Action Group, Richard Caulfield um, from the Association of Colleges, Henry Morrison from uh, the Northern Powerhouse, and Councillor Sue Hinchcliffe from Bradford Council. I hope everyone's been mic'd up at this stage. Yeah, we actually met on a screen for the first time about a day ago. <laughs> like 36 questions. We're all mic'd up down there. Yeah, great. Susan, well done for being the uh, culture capital. Being straightly <laughs> too clumsy to contrive or before. <laughs> well done. Um, yeah, that's going to be, and is that going to mean a lot for young people as well? Is your prompt there to tell yes. us? Yeah. Absolutely. So the bid was led by young people uh, and we sent a, a group of 100 young people actually down to Coventry whilst it was on to see how they were doing it. And they came back fully infused and with great, uh, you know, great legal equalities, actually, of our young people. So, yes, it's going to be for them. And it does after probably two years of the pandemic. And I'm sure that will come up. You know, they've really been struggling through school and education. It will be something where they can really now start to build confidence for the future. Yeah. Great. Well, that's one of the residents of the area around those leaders as well. Um, so um, this is um, now where we've got uh, a session looking at uh, uh, the education gaps um, uh, and really hearing from uh, the panel, which come from, you know, all different aspects of any life you like, what it will take to really ensure that opportunity is realised. And um, uh, you know, I think what all the questions that we're getting, all of the discussion, everyone knows that, you know, the potential to unleash talent and to re-engineer the future of, of young people um, in the area is just immense. But, you know, I, I'm a realist as well. I know it's not going to happen of its own accord. So a big question for me is, what will it take? And I wanted to just start off by asking people around uh, this table here, um, just in a couple of minutes each, really. What do you think it will take to realise what we're talking about here, to get to the prize? Henry, do you want to start? Sorry to keep on. Yeah, no, it's absolutely fine. And it, and I won't, I won't steal any of uh, Susan's thunder. I'm sure Susan will talk because we've got about the opportunity area in Bradford. Um, but that's a good place to start because it's going to take us intervening in individual places. So, as Anne's work uh, when she was children's commissioner, her, her report on on growing up north showed. Some research we did around the same sort of time that first brought us together with Anne on this agenda all those years ago. Um, the issue is that in certain places we have large numbers of long term disadvantaged kids. So those are kids who are on free school meals under its current definition uh, for the whole time they're in either primary or secondary education. And we know in particular those children are the most likely to fall behind uh, during their secondary education. So in the northeast, we have some of the best primary performance historically in the country, though London is closing the gap. But it's a secondary school where those children really fall behind. And what we know is that the traditional approach of simply academising more schools in those areas, because almost all these communities have entirely academised secondary schools, is that that doesn't necessarily get the job done. Uh, and we're really pleased to be seeing Right to Succeed working uh, along with Shine and other partners in North Birkenhead, trying to fix some of these problems very similar to the efforts that Susan's made, funded by the government in Bradford and in other opportunity areas over the last few years. But the kind of the the impact and the focus needs to be on, particularly those white working class and black Caribbean kids who even do worse than their cohort as a whole. And, and because so many of our northern communities have such high concentrations of these types of young people with these types of backgrounds, we essentially have a, a huge concentration issue. So there is a problem in this country that the most disadvantaged children fall the furthest behind. But that particularly affects the north of England and the West Midlands because the vast majority actually of white working class and black Caribbean kids are focused where they're in the highest concentrations in these places and they tend to go to the same schools and, and why I allude to that place-based approach is that unless you look at the whole system not just at education but at housing at health we can't address the fundamental inequalities that we know are holding children back so as someone who kind of runs a think tank that's supposedly about the importance of agglomeration economics this might seem a very strange presentation to be giving you but fundamentally, you cannot solve the North's macroeconomic issues around our long-term underperformance compared to the South of England, unless you ensure that young people uh, from all backgrounds are able to participate in the economy. Otherwise, the growth of cities like Manchester will bring well-educated middle-class kids from the South and other parts of the country to Manchester, 
to take the opportunities we're creating here in the city and creating in, in cities like in, in West Yorkshire and Leeds and in Bradford. And what we want, if we are genuinely going to close the North South divide, is the opportunities we're producing in some of our highest value sectors being open, whether it's through high quality apprenticeships or through uh, other forms of advanced skills, to be able to go to those people who have those significant barriers. And we're doing some research at the moment that shows, and um, we publish shortly, that in, when once kids even get to 25, the gaps in outcomes are terrible uh, for those children from the disadvantaged backgrounds because they have lower social capital and they often have very little access to the adult skill system because they've been locked out. And I think maybe in the discussion we get on a little bit to what we can do about adult skills because the devolution Alex referred to here in Greater Manchester could help solve some of those problems for young people who've already gone through that system. We need to stop it happening to those people going into the education system today why Anne's focus on early health and prevention and on the early years is so important because whether it be the early years primary or secondary school, we need to be tackling these issues and these gaps before they widen. And in this country, we've taken money out of early years, we've taken money out of some of those disadvantaged communities, and we haven't, under this government in 12 years, spent anywhere near enough money on the most disadvantaged children in the most challenging areas. Those need to be our focus. It's not about simply spending more education in totality, because this government talks about so often, but focusing up money on the kids that most need it. Because if you don't focus on the most disadvantaged, all you're doing is actually rewarding those who have access to opportunities already, rather than addressing the fundamental inequalities in our society, which all start in childhood and adolescence, and they are fundamental to making it a fairer country. Thank you. Um, and Susan, I mean, some of just the, the stats themselves are so stark, aren't they? I mean, Henry's given us that there, but this advantage gap of, of 18 months before the pandemic um, increasing, 40% uh, of that happens before kids even go to school. Um, you're three times as likely to go to university if you um, are, if you're on free school meals, if you're living in uh, parts of East London than you are in parts of the north and of the places where uh, most children leave without basic qualifications in the whole country for are in the north. I mean, they're so stark. How do you think, you know, how do you go about changing that? And it, obviously it's not something where you know, there's not going to be a magic fix. What will, what, you know, what's the recipe, if you like, from your point of view of changing that? There's multiple barriers to success, isn't there, for our young people. And I think, obviously, we have had education opportunities in Bradford, which has been very welcome. Of 12 areas in the country, and we were one of those. Yet, because we're the youngest city in the country, we made up 25% of all the children on that programme nationally. <laughs> so we, the scale of our challenge uh, and the disadvantage is huge, actually. Um, and what we found through working with education opportunity area and through Born in Bradford, actually, which is a longitudinal study of all our young people over a, a now almost a 10 year period, um, is that um, it's several things. First of all, you know, fundamental things like glasses, glasses for classes, for example, was something that came out of Born in Bradford, which found that actually disadvantaged young people didn't necessarily have the glasses to actually be able to read. So if reading a disadvantage is there, then can they actually read the board in the first place or read the books in the first place? So getting them a, a pair of glasses in the classroom and at home, a fundamental basic thing we can do, which actually starts to alleviate some of that disadvantage. But also um, something like therapeutic support. Um, our young people have mental health issues, which may be brought on by poverty and disadvantage, but also, you know, I'm afraid we have um, a CAMS and mental health real demand at the moment in our system, which if it's not supported, those young people cannot succeed. So uh, we put as a local authority, more therapeutic support into schools, um, obviously support for literacy and numeracy, reducing persistent absence actually as well. If they're not at school, they can't learn. So how do we do that? Um, and again, that's the local authority money that's having to go into that. Uh, and then I think you move on to FE. I mean, we've mentioned FE. I think it's a really important place for us to try and catch up some of that disadvantage. Uh, but we do need the right policy leaders nationally for that. Yes, it needs funding, but also there's been talk of BTEX being phased out from 2024, which is a massive mistake if we're talking about levelling up and trying to you know, narrow the gap of disadvantage. Not all young people are going to be ready to do T-levels from the get-go. 
and, and actually so we mentioned it earlier can they find the work placements in that local area especially if that one thousand pound grant has now been taken away from the private sector to be able to give those work placements so there's there's, there's some unintended consequences here i think in different <coughs> policy which are going to entrench that entrench that disadvantage unless they listen to local leaders and devolved authorities i'm a big fan of devolution we've got devolution now in west yorkshire uh, with Mayor Tracy Brabin, and we've got that AEB budget coming down, but we need more of that, less national initiatives, more local and regional responsive ones that, that work. We've got a few here, here is. Um, Shay, you work with some of the most disadvantaged kids, really, in difficult times as well. We know that a lot of the, um, you know, the issues that, that kids are experiencing in school something beyond the school gate also that the um you know the home environment of the child really has an impact on their whole life chances i mean what what, what what's your take on this i think it's quite simple if we don't close the gap in education we're going to end up with more and more young people who need help from people like me and my organization and that doesn't make sense to me because what actually we don't want to exist we want center points to be gone by 2037. And that will only happen. Very precise. It's very precise. <laughs> and, and, and the reason we've gone for 2037 is that the first time we said that was, what would it, it was last year. And we okay. said, actually, what would it take? How long do we need to abolish center points? 16 years. Because that's the youngest age at which a young person can come to the organization. So we don't want to exist in 16 years' time. But if we're not going to exist in 16 years' time, that gap needs to be closed. And I think it's a fundamental error to think that the gap is just about what happens in schools. It's not just about schools. It's actually about what happens in families. That's where the problem really, really starts. And if we get that wrong, then that problem spills over into schools. Kids then leave school without the right education, the right skills, and so on and so forth. And they end up if they're lucky, with a center point who helps them to put their lives back together again. But actually, if they're not lucky, what happens is that they then go on a downward spiral. And there's a point at which they, they slip down the spiral so long that it's really difficult to bring them back up again. Uh, and so we can talk about boot camps and all that sort of stuff as much as we want. If someone is way down the spiral, this is going to burn. Boot camps don't help very much. I'll tell you why. Because I know that roughly 30% of kids who end up in center point that, that I work with, roughly about 30% of them, can't read or write properly. They're 16 and 17 year olds. So actually, my work with them has to start with function skills. How do you how do you actually read? Actually, what you said, Susan, is really resonating with me about glasses. For example, young people will tell you that I can't do it. They just find ways not to do it, right? So if you get a cohort where 30% of them can't read or write properly, they're not literate, they're not literate, that's where you're starting from. And you don't tackle that problem. They are the ones who at 25 will be way beyond the range. And then what you end up with is long-term baked unemployment that is sat in the system. And earlier this morning, we heard that uh, unemployment is, is low overall when you look at the data. Actually, scratch behind that data, what you will find is that there's high unemployment in different pockets of the country. And that's where this concentration of people are. So I'm delighted that, uh, actually, to quote Will Queens, here's what he said. He said, if we give children a quality education and a fair shot, they can and will do incredible things. He's right. The problem, the point, the, yeah, is <laughs> the if. The if is what is a fair shot? What is a fair shot? A fair shot has to start with investing in families. So I'm pleased that the government is saying we'll put a bit more money into the supporting families program. That's great. Question is how is that money going to be accessed? How is it going to be used? How is it going to be devolved? And is that money going to get to the right families who actually need it? What are you going to do with the money when it gets to the families? We've talked about childcare costs today, talked about glasses in the home, talked about free school meals. Actually, 
One other thing about free school meals, we use free, free school meals to judge deprivation. But there are families who sleep through that, right? They're not picked up because the kids aren't on free school meals and the poverty is just as bad. How do we actually reach those families there as well and help them with all these issues that mean that you can actually have a child who turns up at school ready to learn? Because if you don't do that, we don't solve the problem. Thank you. Lots of them. Um, I think yes, it's really important. Um, Georgina, um, I guess you'd like your organisation not to have to exist as well. Um, but sadly, it's needed for now. Um, Four million uh, children living in poverty, 75% of those whose parents are working. Um, and that's a vast difference to how it was 20 years ago. And I don't actually think that Politicians always get that bit. Um, a lot of those parents with uh, several jobs, there's lots of predictions, Resolution Foundation and yourselves about how that will increase over coming years. Obviously, cost of living um, crisis biting and the whole issue about free school meals, which I know you've been, um, thank you for being so involved in that, pushing for that extra million kids who are in poverty but don't get uh, free school meals. Um, in the North, in particular, yeah. as Henry says, there's entrenched poverty in some areas, multi-generational. And that, for me, is a, is, is a different proposition than looking at some areas where you've got, you know, maybe Hackney or others in London, it's a different proposition. And uh, I think the poverty rate in, 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 in parts of the North, it's, 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 it's much higher in parts of the North than it would be, um, in other areas. Um, I mean, where, what can you see within both leveling up, but also in the education, employment and skills agenda that, what would it take to really speak to um, those kids that are growing up in poverty? You know, quite how, you know, how, how far back do we need to go? So I think the, the first thing I guess to say is that actually child poverty doesn't feature in terms of levelling up or the school's white paper. And this is the, the, the fundamental challenge and issue that we've got, that any interventions, policies, strategies that we're trying to put in place through the education system to address gaps are always going to be held back unless we get to the root cause, which is the levels of, of child poverty that our young people are, are facing today. Um, we have to support our schools and colleges better to be able to support our young people. Our schools are doing amazing things, but they can't do it all and they shouldn't be doing it all. They, we need to address poverty as, as the root cause rather than asking schools to, to address all of these different things. Um, at present, and we've talked statistics today, but as somebody that was a teacher in a previous role, in an average classroom, eight of those young, in an average classroom of 30, eight young people will be grown up in poverty. And again, in the Northeast, significantly higher than that. Um, and we don't see that in terms of free school meals. It's not what we measure in education. It's not what we acknowledge or, or what's reported in education, because actually a third of children that are grown up in poverty won't be getting that free school meal, therefore don't, um, aren't eligible for additional types of support that come through initiatives such as the People Premium. And also it makes it really difficult for schools and colleges to identify who might be in need of that additional support because where free school meals only measure as a proportion of children and young people experience in poverty, it doesn't capture anybody because we have an incredibly low threshold to be able to, um, to do that. And so much is tied up in free school meals. That, that is the go-to thing in education, but actually it's, it's not a reliable proxy for what we're talking about. That being said, I think there are some things that we can do within our education system. And we've been um, running a project, a child poverty action group called The Cost of the School Day. And the first thing we've got to do is listen to our young people and children. So we've now spoken to over 5,000 young people in England to understand what school is like if you are living in a household where things are more difficult financially, what the experience of being in school is like. 
And what children and young people have told us is that there's not equity of opportunity and participation within our schools because we talk about glasses, but families face costs to send their children to school here in, in the UK. There's uniform costs, stationary costs, ingredients for food technology lessons, instrument lessons to be able to do a music GCSE, calculate as the vision guides, textbooks. And that's before we get into those additional parts of our education system that we want everybody to be able to participate in. So things like the trips and the clubs and all of those nice bits that we remember about our time at school. And this isn't a critique of schools because like I said, schools are doing an amazing job, but I think we need to start by looking at what do we want that, that experience of education for all children and young people to be? What is important within our education system? And where are children missing out? Because what's really clear from speaking to, to young people is that children are missing out on the wonderful things our education system has to offer because of some of these barriers that they face around household income. So I think that's where the starting point. And I guess with that as well, all of those things mean that you're not going to be able to look ahead and possibly planning your future because you literally don't have either self-confidence or the belief that the future is something that you can um you know take control of which is it's so different from um uh, families in a, a, a different situation um but this is all something we can do something about isn't it we're talking here about problems we you know we can we we can intervene i know colleges have a, a particularly large number of, of disadvantaged kids that will come to them and work particularly hard to try to be inclusive and support their needs and the like. Um, give us some hope we can do something about that. I wanted also, um, I wanted also that, you know, just this, the, obviously this figures out this week um, from Resolution, I think, Foundation saying um, that uh, poor mental health being the biggest driver of worklessness, a growth in worklessness for 18 to 25 year olds also there's a figure in the northeast that a third of all the people that are not working are 16 to 24 and that's 30,000 people you know imagine being one of those 30,000 at that stage in your life it's obviously um uh, not where anyone would want you to be i'm roaming a bit on your brief here yeah. but feel free to it's tackle part, part all of that we, we took part in a round table didn't we earlier this, okay. this will teach health. him for coming on my screen yeah. two days yeah, ago so little did he realize i lead on mental health the association of colleges as well so i see on a daily basis the challenge around mental health in further education in that for our young people for the services that are there and actually i had that down as well i started off with three points i'm up to seven at the moment <laughs> I'm I'm, and get I'm getting angrier <laughs> That's it. but you know if we don't tackle the mental health issues if we don't Tackle, as Henry said, some of the wider issues. There's only so much education institutions themselves can do. And actually, just one last thing about that: you asked the colleges at, on that roundtable put their hands up if they were running a food bank for their students, and 50% yeah. of the colleges put their hands up. So that's what we're seeing. And a lot of the staff colleges. were buying the food and themselves. The staff are buying the food. It. And I'm, so I'm going to start with, and it, it always feels painful to start with. We need further investment, doesn't it? Because it always sounds like you're coming with a bit of a begging bowl and asking for money, but Actually, we do need investment in our skills infrastructure if we're going to tackle any of the issues that we've looked at today. Um, I think we looked at IFS reported recently that even with the government's prioritising of further education, as they would say, that by 24, 25, that 16 to 18 year old funding will be 10% lower than it was in 2010. So that's 15 years later, we're still 10% below the previous investment. And that's when the government prioritise it. So goodness knows what we do when we're not a priority. Um, and adult education, actually, 33% less by the time we get to 2024. So real underinvestment in the system, and we will not turn it around. We have a workforce crisis at the moment, recruiting staff. And that, a, a teacher in further education is generally paid about £9,000 less than a teacher in schools. We have a real issue with pay. If we're going to get the people to provide the training, the skills, we want our students to come out with them skills then we're going to have invest in that workforce and if we don't do it there's a problem um so i'm trying to call the solutions am i yeah yeah, in fact, right, yeah. we can um, come on to solutions yeah. Yeah. we don't have to get it all and, in and, bit. and actually i had investment but not initiative itis and i've heard a couple of them things sort of said today you know the minister talks about multiply 
what we're doing landing multiply on the landscape of skills right this very second i do not know yes we need investment to help us build up numeracy but we don't need another initiative let's build on what we've got what we know that works and everyone's trying to work out what the heck it means right this very second boot camps other things they throw initiatives at us give us the right investment give us a plan like someone was saying earlier and let's stick to that plan and work with it we can do something apprenticeships we had a good question about apprenticeships earlier a massive need for reform there an interesting thing that's happening at the moment that i'm getting reported to me is lots of people are getting the qualification they need which is part of the apprenticeship and then wages are so low for apprentices or the opportunity to end they're not finishing the apprenticeship by going through an endpoint assessment they're going out to take a further job actually oddly good for the employer in that case because they've got the qualification it's good for the person who's taken the apprenticeship because they've you know managed to progress actually the provider ends up stumped for cash and quality so actually it's not got a skill system that's based on employer need and provider need it's a confused system and actually um, we also heard mention of the apprenticeship levy earlier why i i'm afraid to say i don't think the levy was brought in to fund mbas in big companies as staff that were already in jobs i think we need to have that levy focused on the under 25s it needs to be focused on young people let's stop doing that it's not hitting where it needs to hit let's have a refocusing of that investment yeah. too let's get careers information advice and guidance right at all ages not just for young people it needs to get right there let's get it right for adults as well um, let's think about what colleges role could be in that could colleges as key anchor institutions locally play a role in that information advice and guidance um reskilling fantastic we need lots more initiatives lifelong lo loans loans aren't going to cut it right this very minute for people people need money right this very minute actually and that's one of our challenges people aren't going to come back to learn on the promise of jam tomorrow they need to be able to eat the bread today not the jam tomorrow and we need to therefore think about where is the money for maintenance where is the money to allow people to retrain to also not be in poverty whilst they're doing that because i think that's going to be a problem and one final flip comment because a couple of speakers have had three p's i've got one p and this is a flip comment but it's a serious one in another sense one of my principals said to me she went when you're speaking can you get them to move park light right she said because it was gcse reset day on uh. monday and she said lots of our 18 year olds came if they came in for the exam were slightly out of it from whatever they've been doing but if you think there are 10,000 young people sitting gcse maths the day after partying for a weekend that exam could be the most important thing on their career trajectory and we put part of our system just works completely against another bit now right it's a bit could not go they could not go but <laughs> But, I'm just saying but they max it. they could not go but we're not you know i guess if i've been working two years you're right but we've got to think about where them young people are at and what we know and what we see you know and we've got to think more sensibly about some of them things um you know but it's about that broader picture there are so many things a college can do that college have staff parked around their borough on the morning of the exam they're ready to take phone calls to drive pick people up and get them to get through their maths because they know how important that qualification is and we've got to think about how we support young people in every single way possible brilliant and it's that level of intervention i.e getting alongside people and actually bothering to understand their lives and bring them in that in my view is what it takes rather than you know kind of shiny stuff so I'm going to ask the audience um, for uh, a few questions here along the way, but I guess what we've heard is, oh, what we've heard is, um, you know, long-term, uh, proper infrastructure, cohesion, understanding, and 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 um, collaborating with um, with with those that understand communities and working communities and um, business in those areas, but also the ability to do it ourselves I think, as well within all of that. Let's do, if we can go get some flavours from the audience and then we'll come back and go around again. So, uh, gentlemen here first. It should be really brief because yep, we've got... Absolutely. Um, it was uh, really interesting to hear us go back to school in this discussion because obviously a lot of the time people think of FE and further employment beyond that in this discussion. I'd like to go back even further um, and ask the panel what they think, what kind of interventions they think could be done um, in the early years 
uh, with recent data showing that um, child development's actually in decline around communication and social skills. Yep, thank you. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to ask a question. Um, during the pandemic, um, our industry, which is the renewable sector, saw a loss of apprenticeships in the supply chain, but a continuation and growth in the developer side of, uh, of its work. And those apprenticeships are incredibly competitive. Um, we can see thousands of people applying for a handful. Um, that loss is really impacting us. I, I'm interested in everything that you said in terms of the longer term uh, history around all of this bridging the gap. We've got a shortage right now <laughs> in terms of people. Um, and I wonder if there is any thought to alternative pathways into different industries that do not just rely on apprenticeships where very often more disadvantaged children could be missing out on opportunities just because of the competitive nature of it. And has there been any thought, I thought it was very interesting in terms of the minister, he didn't really seem to address that there had been drops in certain areas around apprenticeships. Um, and is there any um, anything in sight uh, coming down the road where we're going to see um, additional growth uh, to support the future of industry in the country? Right. Um, and then this gentleman here, we'll do this our first group and see how far we get on. I'm going to pass you first. Uh, thank you very much. My name is Ewan McCall and I'm from the WISE group. Um, last year, we worked with around about 50,000 people um, across sort of employment, justice and fuel poverty over a course of months and sometimes years um, to try and improve their situation. And with that sort of huge amount of um, information and insight that we're gathering from this very vulnerable customer uh, base, um, we found within a study in the Northeast um, that around about 75% of young people that we were speaking with didn't feel comfortable going into an interview situation, especially an interview situation online. And interview situations in person uh, also had barriers around about travel, as we've mentioned, um, but also around about feeling as if they've not got the right clothes, they don't feel as if they're able to uh, have clean clothes as well. Um, so there's a huge number of people that are excluded for that reason, and also digitally as well. Um, and I'm just wondering, how are you, how are your organisations reaching uh, young people and adults who are digitally excluded um, and are uncomfortable about their own situations? Right, thank you. Um, can we start with you, Amy, in terms of that skills gap, but also the pathways gap? Um, and then more from to you, if you like, Susan, about, you know, from a, from a, a, a city perspective, you know, how do you build that collaboration in schools that aren't, you know, aren't now under the command of local authority um, uh, with business and with opportunity? How do you grow those? Uh, Henry? I think Mel's point's really well observed. And I, I it's certainly, it, it, it's definitely the case in other sectors as well beyond beyond renewables. I think. And, and I think the challenge is to what extent is the further education system being incentivized and funded to provide pathways to the jobs that exist? Because often, the pathways to those jobs are more expensive than the ones that we're currently prepared to fund. So the FE system in Grimsby is not incentivised financially to provide people to your industry. It's provided with the same financial settlement, with the same drivers as every other college in the country. And so our, our existential answer to that is you do need to give more levers to the public sector in Lincolnshire to decide to spend whatever limited post-19 funding we have or whatever other levers we can use to get people into those those sectors and I think the kind of colonization of apprenticeships by middle class kids particularly degree apprenticeships is a definite factor and there are some things we can do to address that so Sheffield Hallam for all their degree apprenticeship programs uh, do pre-work with disadvantaged kids to get them in a position so that when they go to the employers on those programs they are more likely to succeed at interview and I think we'd be really keen to work with you Mel to see if we can design something similar for the the sectors you work with because i think there is a replicable model there we'd be really keen to develop with you uh, for that for that for that situation but i think the wider existential point is just saying that even if we could do more on levy sharing and pooling and alex didn't get onto that but things you could do in the north that would benefit 
to grow the apprenticeship pool, they shouldn't be the only mechanism to get disadvantaged kids into higher skilled jobs. We do need to incentivise and fund the FE system to provide the courses that are needed in each location. And, and even if those courses have a higher cost to deliver them, we should be incentivising colleges to provide what's needed. And I don't necessarily think uh, it's the fault of the sector. I think the reality is that they are funded to provide in essentially units of accredited learning and they are not incentivized structurally to fund and be able to provide units that are most suited to the place they're based in and i think that we need to be focusing a lot more on what the structural incentives are and just having a few employer partnerships as valuable as the work the chamber of commerce currently doing supported by government doesn't actually move the financial incentives it just improves the edges the kind of links and the, the conversations i think what's happening in greater manchester where now the money does follow and in other devolved areas through the AEB, and as Susan alluded to now in West Yorkshire, where the money can be directed based on the needs of the economy, rather than simply what some funding agency in London thinks is a good idea, is the right first step. But we are miles away from funding colleges based on the needs of local employers. And people in Blackpool, for instance, that were mentioned earlier, who are focusing on the digital sector, they are all doing that despite the drivers on the sector, not because of them. And the colleges that are able to make it pay do that but i don't think in every situation the local fe sector and the local wider provider sector is always being funded to provide the the right courses for the employers in their area and i don't think it's the fault of the employers in the area often and i don't think it's the fault of the colleges i think it's the fault of the fact we have a national funding system that funds courses that are the cheapest essentially because it wants bums on seats and i'm not really interested in the numbers of people going through the fe system or through the wider skill system i'm interested in how many of those people are getting into higher paid higher skilled jobs and as the north of england becomes more productive and we take out large numbers of lower skilled and unskilled jobs we've got to focus on that because otherwise we're also not going to be able to meet the government and our all our own wider ambitions to enable higher skilled businesses to grow because the current public funding system and the level of employer funding for skills which is also beyond the levy almost non-existent has got to change otherwise we're never going to become a more productive country never going to become a more productive north of england Susan, your your um, local, um, you know, um, your local area in terms of uh, uh, that complex nature of uh, both learning, but also that pathway into employment. So I think I think it's a real challenge. I mean, in, in Bradford, we've got 140,000 children um, and 220 schools, and therefore making sure there's a good partnership between learning providers. Mm -hmm. Uh, and the business community takes time, takes partnership work. And of course, we've already heard this morning that the capacity of local authorities has been reduced to be able to do some of that work. In spite of that, actually, <laughs> for us, it is a priority in Bradford, given our young population. And we have something called that we fund called Industrial Centres of Excellence. And we have 86 business leaders on those boards um, with nine across nine different sectors, working with secondary schools and colleges <clears throat> to shape the curriculum. And there's about 14,000 uh, young people benefited from that, whether that's um, access to um, learning, uh, work experience, uh, and actually directing them into something that they enjoy and that they know about. The best, most successful people are the best networks and actually providing them with that business community around them and supporting the curriculum and direct access into that school and to those learners does help them raise their aspirations and look at what's out there so that they're actually uh, motivated and equipped to get the opportunities they need. But that is only 14,000. I've got 140,000 children. Mm. So it's a big uh, thing about scale, isn't and it? And scaling that up yeah. and sustaining the finance of that is a real challenge. There's real willingness from the business community to participate, but they need to be able to plug and play, if you like, and that requires work in the public sector to be able to provide that plug and play for them. Yeah. Um, I'm being told to hurry up because I know lunch is ready. Um, in terms of the the question about the uh, kind of the scaffolding that that some uh, kids might benefit from, or indeed, um, you know, um, uh, their 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 parents and adults too. What is there? A, is there a have you? What is the best example you've seen of where that works? Brief because we are being moved along. I'm afraid. Um, I'm struggling to think of good examples. Actually, before I get into that. I, just, I, I want to pull into the point that Harry and Susan have been making. This point uh, that we, nobody is incentivized to actually help young people have soft skills. 
and that is really, really critical to them actually getting on in the world of work. I, neither schools nor ethnic colleges themselves are, are incentivized to do that. In relation to the scaffolding issue, what I would like to see is... Are you not incentivized? I, 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 Isn't I, I that really, what you do? I really strongly disagree with what's been said about what goes on in ethnic colleges. And I think if you walked into a college, if I could, let me take you by the fair, hand I went and take you into a college <laughs> and show you what they are doing. Because they are doing marvellous things. I'm not saying that some people don't get left behind in that, or some people don't access that, but colleges are doing marvellous things. in the system in the incentive. Exactly. I, I do think exactly. colleges, no, no, so college, no, I'm, I'm not saying that some colleges are not doing this. But the system incentivizes <laughs> away from lots of what we're doing. Exactly. That, that's the point. That is the, the crystal point that I'm uh, making. But he still but, does have some yeah. thing to do with it. Yeah. Uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Can I just say one, one, one other thing about this scaffolding? I'm just, just going to say this interesting thing about the money that the government wants to spend on supporting family programs. That's a program into which some money has been put. It will finish in 2025. Actually, we're still going to have children born in 2025. And they're still going to need help in 2026 and 27 and 28. So, actually, it seems to me that a better way to tackle that scaffolding issue is to bring all those things into the universal credit system. And then you actually bake it into what happens long term. And it, becomes, and it becomes something that is driven by individuals themselves, not done to individuals. And just, just Georgina, on, that, uh, on the point of, of training work, because you know, I really, you know, I, I, I remember when <laughs> You know, there was lots of investment in childcare that was free at the point of use for, for parents who wanted to drain. Um, what, do, you get, do you have any sense that that's part of the, um, anything like that's coming along anytime soon? Or do you think it's now been divorced in, in people's heads? I, I think we've got a challenge, as my colleague mentioned earlier, around making sure that there is childcare, that um, people are able to access the question about early years, absolutely more of it. I, I guess I was nodding along of the, the question about sort of uh, things for interviews. We hear so many different terms around poverty. So fuel poverty, clothes and poverty, furniture poverty. It all comes down to the fact that people don't have enough money. And the answer to that is within our social security system and benefits themselves and, and universal cre credit offering adequate levels of support to families. That's the, the fundamental part that we should be looking at and, and advocating for rather than lots of different add-ons and third sector organizations or having to plug gaps around suits for interviews and transport costs for interviews and small things coming through the household support fund in terms of uh, energy support let's just make sure we've got a system that fundamentally provides enough for people to be able to make their own decisions and live live their lives sort of autonomously Brilliant. Um, we're going to have to draw to a close. I'm really sorry, um, but uh, um, lunch is um, on its way. Um, but I wanted to ask some final questions. It's, uh, it's also warming you up for the session after lunch, which is um, the uh, mayoral panel. Um, do you think that devolution is the way that this is going to happen properly? Um, uh, or, or some kind of you know regional generated um, uh, plan, program, you know, uh, whatever you want to call it. Do you think it's going to come down to devolution in the end? Or do you think um, that would take it down at a place that, um, you know, would be missing out of opportunities? So no, uh, I'm going to ask down down this end. Yeah. Susan, I know you're, that's right. That's no, the length of answer I'm after. Exactly. So devolution. It was an easy question that yeah, she'd already said it and I knew. Um, okay. Uh, yes. Where would you have it? It can't all be devolution. Yeah, it? yes, for everything but the social security system. So, so <laughs> what the targeted intervention you do, because I would, the one distinction I would make is that I agree that we don't, we don't, we don't have enough income going to the poorest families. That's clearly true, but I do still think there are things you can do uh, around health and education investment in particular that would uh, challenge the fact that unfortunately we live in one of the most unequal countries in mm. the developed world. <laughs> And even if you spent more money in the universal credit system in the coming parliament and the one after that and the one after that, you would still have structural inequalities that have been created in the last 50 years. So you're going to have to have targeted investment. And in Greater Manchester, Andy has targeted and set minimum standards for the most deprived neighbourhoods to be, have better outcomes. And that is exactly how we can do this, because the same way that, that Manchester was able to regenerate a city centre, 
the same way that, that the renaissance of many of our urban cities has been a great achievement in the last 20 years, addressing the inequalities in our neighbourhoods and addressing the fact that young people from different backgrounds do so differently in society is fundamentally the next big challenge for the north of England. And it is more important than trains, and it is more important than innovation, it is more important than everything else. It's more important than everything else, because if you don't do that, you can have all the investment you want in the things that Susan and I both believe so strongly in. We want, the, we want the people in Bradford, the people in Manchester, in Oldham, in Bury, to have the opportunities to go and do things. But they themselves need to be enabled and capable of taking advantage of the opportunities we want to create for them. My top three is transport, skills and culture. That's what I focus on. You've got one out of three. You've got one. I knew the other two thought, yeah. Um, really briefly. Um, what, it's not the, it's your, not the be your, all and end all of everything. Um, I don't want skills 16 to 18 year olds devolved because I just think the complexity okay. of doing that is way too big and it would be a mess. Okay. Devolve. Yes, I mean, I think Richard made a point earlier on. Uh, I don't, what he said was you need to meet people where they're at. Uh, and I, I don't see how you can do that with our model. So this, um, it's, it's not something I have a definitive answer on other than to say I think there's big things for social security I've already talked about, but what happens at a local level, what our individual multi-academy trusts do, what our individual schools do, what our individual colleges do also make a really big difference too. So there's definitely a role for, for both. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, we've come to the end of our time before lunch, I'm afraid, but thank all our panel for a, a brilliant discussion, really deep and rich uh, knowledge there that's been brought to this and thank you 